Good morning. Um, before we get started, if you could please mute your mic. Um, we do have Corey looking um, in the chat and um, for questions, we have opportunity to ask questions at the end. We wanna let people know that this session is being recorded. Corey, if you could start the recording, please. Um, last sessions on community mapping is now available. Corey will put it in the chat for you to have the link. And once this session is completed, we'll have to convert from Zoom to YouTube. So we'll make sure that we send that link out once we get that. So good morning and welcome. I'm Tanya on behalf of Community Living Algoma. We'd like to welcome you today to session four. Uh, I wanna welcome our CLA employees, our CLA board members, and also our guests from Social Services Sault Ste. Marie, Canadian Mental Health Sault Ste. Marie, Community Living Guelph Wellington, Kenora Association for Community Living, the Town Council from Horn Payne, Community Living Bryant, Community Living Upper Ottawa Valley, Community Living St. Mary's, Community Living Greater Sudbury, Southeast Gray Supports and Services. So today, Al is here to talk to us about understanding the social infrastructure. And for those that don't know you, I have the privilege of introducing Al. So Dr. Al Condalusi has been a leader in community building, human services and inclusive advocacy work for the past 50 years. Holding a PhD in MSW from the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Condalusi has been the CEO of CLASS Community Living and Support Services, a major nonprofit community building organization in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, from 1973 to 2019. He holds faculty status at the University of Pittsburgh in the schools of social work and health, rehab sciences, and is author of seven books, including the acclaimed Interdependence, The Route to Community, and more recently, Social Capital, The Key to Macro Change. In 2018, he received the key to the city of Pittsburgh the highest civilian honor that can be given to a community member. He serves as a consultant, advisor, and human service coach and is on a number of nonprofit boards and government commissions of state, local, and national levels. He helped found and convenes the Interdependence Network, an international coalition of professionals, family members, and consumers interested in community engagement and macro change. His contact information will be at the end of his presentation. And the information today was sent out yesterday, but if you need a copy, just email me and I'll send that to you. So please welcome Al. Great, thanks, uh, Tanya, and and welcome back, everyone, to our uh, uh, our training series sponsored by uh, Community Living Algoma, <clears throat> looking at the whole notion of meaningful uh, community engagement and participation. Uh, this is part of a project that Community Li Living Algoma is uh, uh, carrying out uh, to not just uh, share ideas and 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 to have uh, training but also to really begin to implement and incorporate uh, the ideas that, uh, that we've been talking about and will continue to talk about in our last session in terms of building community. If you've been with us um, in this journey, um, this is our fourth uh, session. And as Tanya indicated, um, the first three sessions are available um, on the YouTube page, the Community Living Algoma page. Um, to, uh, to review or to share uh, with your, your staff or your colleagues. Um, the first session that we did really focused in on social isolation and loneliness as, as huge issues, um, not just for folks with disabilities, uh, but really hu huge uh, challenges for our society at large. Um, everywhere in the world, um, there's been an increase in social isolation, this is pre-pandemic, uh, even before um, the COVID virus and, and, and the, uh, uh, the struggles the, that we've been uh, dealing with this past year, um, even before then, we've seen social isolation and, and, and loneliness on the rise uh, in, our, in our countries. Certainly uh, here in the United States, uh, where I'm based uh, in Canada, uh, the UK, um, the Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand um, have uh, put, uh, you know, put in place um, ways and means to, uh, to address social isolation and loneliness. Um, but the antidote, the, the way that you really, um, you know, address or, 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 or directly challenge the ill effects of social isolation and loneliness is through building relationships. 
and facilitating, supporting people uh, to build social capital, which was the uh, topic for our second uh, webinar that we did. Um, and in that webinar, we really took a look at social capital and we, we, we defined it and we described it and we broke it down. Um, we looked at what the literature uh, and what uh, research has uh, borne out related to social capital. And, um, and, and we really focused in on some strategies, four steps uh, for, for building a social capital identifying people's, um, people's affinities or, or their passions, um, step one. Step two, um, understanding uh, the community and uncovering um, the places and spaces where people might gather around those interests. Uh, step three, focusing in on the infrastructure. And step four, finding the gatekeeper. Um, our third session focused in on the on the second step of that four-step process, which is mapping the community. That, that webinar is now online and available uh, for you to take a look at. And in that session, we talked about community. We identified resources, um, the common uh, spaces and the common places, and the, um, the identifying uh, the, the, the gathering points of our community. And we talked about how community mapping is actually carried out. And uh, we actually focused in on how you might begin to chronicle what you discover in community, creating a database or creating a, um, um, you know, a, um, a scrapbook or uh, a uh, file system that would identify these community resources. We also in that session talked about uh, meetup.com, which is the uh, um, which is a social invent uh, social network inventory of resources that you could go online. You could uh, go to meetup.com. You type in what you're interested in. Up comes um, the clubs, groups, and associations that might correspond to that interest. So just understanding what is available in our community, a, a critical a component, um, which leads us now to our, our, uh, our, our topic for today, um, which is the third step of the community building or the social capital building strategy um, um, uh, framework. Uh, and that third step is understanding the social infrastructure of the community. Now, it sounds like a big word, social infrastructure. It you know, sounds like the kind of jargon that, you know, that you know, causes you to look another way or think another, another thought. But I want to break it down and talk about the infrastructure of the resources that we identify in our community, community mapping uh, process. And um, you know, social infrastructure is an interesting uh, phenomenon, but let's, let's take a look at it. We'll... we'll um, uh, we'll, we'll break it down and then we'll really focus in on the key elements in understanding uh, the social infrastructure. Um, you know, and all of this is done in the spirit of finding authentic or meaningful connecting points for people. And not just for people that, that have disabilities, but for any of us finding uh, meaningful places to connect and opportunities where people could build uh, relationships and, and, and uh, trusting uh, connections with other people is really the, you know, it's the, it, it's the bottom line of this entire training series that Community Living Algoma has put together. And it's also the bottom line for the project uh, that Community Living Algoma is embarking on in terms of identifying some folks that they serve and really looking for those authentic opportunities uh, for community building. Now, in this entire uh, process, in the first three sessions that we had, and obviously in this session as well, um, we really need to delineate between micro approaches and macro approaches. 
Excuse me, one second. Yeah. I my book. What? I need this. Hurry up. Um, excuse me. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the book. Okay. I need it. I need okay. It. Not okay, <laughs> here you go. Uh, honey, uh, I got, I'm sorry. I got, I got to get back here. Okay, hurry up. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Excuse us. That was my, my wife had a, um, had a making a, a critical appointment and needed some information. And so she's gotten what she needs. Um, the micro and the macro approaches is where we were. And it's really important that we understand that micro approaches are things that we do individually with people or to people or for people. Um, the other side of this dimension is the macro approach. And the macro approach is really where we're focusing most of our attention as we think about social infrastructure. Um, but both of these approaches um, are critical if we're going to really facilitate meaningful uh, opportunities for people uh, to engage. And the ultimate goal, which we talked about in our second uh, webinar, is uh, building relationships, social capital. And, and uh, having the folks that might be on the fringe of society or on the, on the borders of community um, have a chance to become um, active members that begin to build meaningful relationships in those situations. Now, social infrastructure is not social capital, right? It's the physical conditions where social capital uh, develops, right? So... Um, the idea of social infrastructure really speaks to how community resources behave, what they do and how they do it. Um, and it, it, it also recognizes the stuff that makes our communities uh, successful. Um, and so this idea of social infrastructure um, grew from the... Um, uh, from the work on social capital, the academic work on social capital, because you know you can't build relationships unless uh, unless there are clearly welcoming um, elements in the infrastructure of that community group. Now, this will make a little more sense as we move forward, but you know when people gather, um, there's a couple elements uh, that play in there. Uh, obviously a place to gather becomes, uh, becomes critical. And that place needs to be accessible, welcoming, uh, comfortable, uh, non-intimidating, right? And then, and, and the hospitality of the gathering includes um, the, um, you know, the nurturing and the feeding of people and, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that people feel like they're apart, like they belong. This little photo is a, a family photo. It's a family heirloom. And, and uh, this is uh, my, my mom and dad and my uncle. Uh, in fact, um, my uncle Will, who was Carrie's father, um, gathering in a little place we built on Condalusi Hill called uh, La Stanza. It's, a, it, it's, you know, we built for our family a gathering place so that no one's private home would be, you know, would be, uh, uh, you know, utilized or taken advantage of. Um, and so in La, La Stanza, every night, our family elders would gather over coffee and pastries and, 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 and they would um, talk about anything. They would talk about nothing. They would talk about really important things. And that's what's beautiful about the infrastructure is that it allows for the engagement of people, right? And there's a relationship between, you know, when you build connections with people that good things happen and they happen to you. Um, so understanding the way community manifests is really our topic for the day. Now, there are two, when, when, when you hear the term social infrastructure, when it's used, and those of you from a civic point of view, I know we have uh, some of the, you know, municipal leaders at Horn Payne uh, on the call, and when any community 
you know, group. Uh, for example, the, the mayor of Horn Payne is really responsible for um, a community that's vibrant and that's active and that's welcoming, right? I mean, those are the kinds of things we want in our community. Now, there are two tracks when you look at the literature on social infrastructure. Um, one is called the techni uh, technocratic check. And this is the physical elements, you know, water, sewage, lighting, uh, warmth. Um, in, in Texas, um, the technocratic elements this past week because of the cold spell really failed uh, in, in the state of Texas where people lost water, they lost electricity and heat for their homes. Um, and so the, the technocratic aspects of infrastructure are the nuts and bolts that keep the lights on, they keep, you know, the roads are plowed so we can drive to the gathering point, um, that there are these important the physical elements that are tended to. Um, you know, you hear politicians all the time talking about infrastructure uh, upgrades. And, and, and infrastructure upgrades include the physical part of that, which is the technocratic part, as well as the civic part of it or the social uh, part of it. And the social part of it is really where we're going to we're gonna uh, uh, dig a little bit deeper and drill a little bit deeper uh, today. But essentially uh, the civic side of community is you know, the welcomeness and the fact that people feel like they can go and they'll be accepted when they go. And so <clears throat> when we think about social infrastructure, just pulling back a little bit, we know that this corresponds with what we talked about last time we met, which was community mapping, right? Libraries, parks, and schools, and these kinds of spaces, both buildings as well as outdoor space, hiking trails and ice skating rinks and you know, other kinds of uh, places and spaces where people can uh, go uh, to meaningfully engage, right? And we know that there's also, you know, civic groups, uh, um, you know, block clubs and, and book clubs and churches and fraternal groups. Uh, and then there's commercial places, cafes and diners and bookstores and, you know, gyms. So all of this fits into the social uh, infrastructure, the, the civic, uh, the physical infrastructure and the, and the civic infrastructure. Now with the pandemic, you know, this has really been heightened because when we were in the throes of the pandemic, really in any country around the world, things closed, right? Gyms were closed and restaurants were closed and places and spaces where people typically would gather with their social capital ceased to be. And, and, and you know, this caused tremendous angst Every one of us on this call were, you know, were um, influenced by the fact that we could not be with our social capital. It was, it was, it, it really, really, I think, uh, awakened uh, our our cultures uh, to the importance of connection. I mean, we know that mental health issues uh, have 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 gone up. That that people uh, depression levels have have risen as as folks have been stuck uh, at home, and and so these kinds of important uh, elements um, of of the infrastructure of community are really important for us to understand. Social connection is based on the vitality and depth of the close and direct intercourse and attachment. Democracy must begin at home, and that home is the neighborly community. So when you think about um, the places that you go um, and the spaces where you celebrate or you gather with folks, all of that becomes vitally important. Now, when we begin to drill down here and we begin to think about um, 
what's the stuff that um, is in the civic or social infrastructure of a group, of, a, of, a, uh, of, of any of those clubs, groups, associations, or places of gathering. These four elements become really important to understand. Right? And I'm gonna go through them uh, in, in, a, in a focused way here, because uh, if we're gonna build community or help build community for people who have been left behind or who have been uh, socially isolated, um, these four things really offer the key to connections. Um, and, 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 and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how we can uh, maneuver or manage these things um, as we try to um, uh, facilitate more meaningful connection, right? So let's, let's kind of start at the very beginning. When, when we're trying to build community for, uh, for my cousin, Carrie, who has, had Down syndrome, or for my dad, who had Parkinson's, right? We start with what are they interested in or care about? What are their assets? What are their passions, right? So that, that start point um, is a conversation that we have. Now, remember, we talked about a cultural profile when we were, when we were in the social capital um, session. And the cultural profile is just a, you know, a, dis a discovery phase of uh, who is the person that you're interested in wanting to see more connected and what do they care about? Okay. So if I was, you know, uh, if I was working with, say, John Policiccio, and, and, and part of that, we wanted to see John get more connected to community, uh, that first step would be a conversation with John to discover what he likes, what he cares about, what he's passionate, what, what he would like to know more about, right? So we start with that in terms of an, uh, a cultural profile or an asset inventory. Right? Step two, then, is we begin to say, okay, we discover that John likes to read. He really enjoys reading. That's one of the things he really likes. With my cousin, Carrie, it was photography. That was one of the things she really liked. And, and so step two would be where in the community that John lives or the Carrie lives, um, do people gather around reading? Are there such places or spaces where people celebrate books and they celebrate ideas and concepts? And, and, and so that's the discovery process in community mapping. Right? Now, if we do community mapping um, antecedently, um, we then would have a file uh, or a database of all the different clubs, groups, and associations in, um, in the Sault Ste. Marie um, you know, general community. Right? Now, you can do community mapping, as you remember from our, 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 session la our last session, you can do community mapping geographically. You can say, okay, John lives here or Carrie lives here, and what's around uh, Carrie? both neighbors, um, you know, resources, uh, places where people can go and hang out um, and not be, you know, not be chased away or considered you know, to be loitering, right? So, so you're identifying all these places and spaces and you're looking for a match, right? Now, once you identify a resource, you can analyze that resource with these four elements that are on this slide right now. That is, I could go to, um, I could find a camera club or I could find a book reading club um, that would match with John's interest, right? With John's passion for reading or Carrie's interest in, um, in photography. Uh, or my dad's interest in jazz, right? I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter what the interest area, finding the uh, matching uh, community resource, critical piece here. That's why my recommendation is that we do this ahead of time, right? That we have an inventory of all these different possibilities for a couple reasons. 
One of the reasons is that if we have a big inventory of community resources, clubs, groups, associations, gathering points, um, we could sit with John and say, well, John, we don't have, you know, we, 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 there's, we couldn't find a book club, although I would, I would imagine that, that we just, just didn't look hard enough. But here's all these other things we find. Does any of this excite you or ignite you in some way? So it, it actually allows us to expand possibilities when we have a database of resources. But once we have those resources identified, then what becomes the, the next step, and this is the social infrastructure step, is how does that resource behave? Right? Let me give an example. And I'll use a, a personal example with my dad. My dad was uh, was a big jazz aficionado. He played the upright bass. Um, you know, he was a writer, uh, so he would write. Um, uh, uh, he would do reporting for Downbeat Magazine, which is a big jazz magazine in the United States. Well, it's around the world actually, and and he would uh, cover jazz artists who visited Pittsburgh. And he would write stories about them, get to know them. Um, so when he came down with Parkinson's and his world started to shrink, we as a family wanted to keep dad engaged. Uh, we wanted to keep him connected. We know how important that is, that connections with people breed life. And isolation breeds death. Right? We knew this. I mean, we all, we've talked about this now for three sessions, right? So finding a jazz resource became, you know, my agenda um, in working with my dad. And, uh, and so I discovered uh, the Pittsburgh Jazz Society. I never knew about them. I discovered them basically in, in, in a search. Um, I was at a, I, I went to a jazz club and, you know, I, I was talking to regulars and I said, you know, there, you know, jazz clubs are great, but are there places where people actually gather, you know, to talk about jazz? Um, and, you know, people told me, well, the Pittsburgh Jazz Society I said, wow, I didn't even know. And so I, you know, looked it up and discovered that they meet every Sunday night at a, at a little lounge in, in a Holiday Inn, not near the university uh, called Jackson's. It's a little just a little like, you know, club. Uh, um, and, and so I went to Jackson's, right? And, and I wanted to um, discover these four things. You see these four things on the slide. When I, when I went to Jackson's, uh, to, the, to, to the Pittsburgh Jazz Society, I wanted to discover rituals, patterns, jargon, and history or memory, right? And, and, and the reason for these things is to facilitate my dad's easier penetration into this, into this jazz society. So that he, when he joined, when we got him to join the jazz society, dad would find greater meaning and greater, you know, greater acceptance and, and, and respect from, you know, the other people there. So rituals, let's start with that. Every community that gathers on a regular basis, whether that community is your family or your church or your neighborhood or, you know, the Pittsburgh Jazz Society or the camera club or the book club that we get joined, any group that gathers on a regular basis, right, where they come again and again and again, begin to create predictable behaviors they begin to manifest these behaviors. Uh, and now that's when, a, that's the transition, by the way, between a group and a culture, right? A group of people, just, and they might gather, you know, to hear a concert or whatever the case might be, but they're not a culture yet. Regularity creates a culture because regularity begins to frame rituals. A, a, you know, a, 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 a good example, an easy example, if you will, on rituals are churches, church services, right? 
And if you're, you know, a church going person on this call and you, you know, just think to back to the last time you were in, you know, church or synagogue or mosque or however you, you celebrate your spirituality. Um, when you walked in, there were rituals that were expected of you in that culture, right? I, I remember when, as a kid, my dad taking me to church for the first time and teaching me the sign of the cross, right? Which is a, a gesture, you know, it's a, it's a gesture that everyone in this community does, right? They touch their forehead in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, right? Those, those kinds of rituals are things that the culture expects of its members, right? So if I want to, if I want to get my dad into the jazz society, I got to know: Do they have rituals? How do they be? You know, uh, how do they manifest when they gather every Sunday night in Jackson's? Right? Is there some predictability? And I guarantee you, the answer to that is yes. There's predictability in gathering. There's predictability in the gathering of your families. Think about when you gathered for the last you know, celebration your family had, um, uh, you know, maybe it was uh, Thanksgiving or, you know, whatever, in Christmas, you know, whatever, there's a, um, there, if it's a regular gathering, if you always add people to your home, probably there are predictable rituals, what people are going to do, right? So I wanted to know with the Jazz Society, what are some of the like you know that timing is part of the ritual okay that the jazz society meets at 7 p.m every sunday at jackson's right same thing with church services nine o'clock mass Pre you know predictability is is part of regularity right um and then behaviors that are uh, specific to the culture like making the sign of the cross in going into a Catholic, sticking your finger in holy water, right? Um, that those kinds of behaviors, right? We want to come to know those things, right? Now, patterns are the social movements of the community, right? That's how when people go to Jackson's uh, for the Pittsburgh Jazz Society gathering on Sunday night, where do they sit? Um, who do they sit with? Right? Um, how do they move around? What are, what are the expected motions? Um, now, you know, you, you get season tickets to the, to, you know, the hockey uh, team, your hockey team. Um, and when you get season tickets, you get a season space. Or, you know, when you buy your ticket just, you know, just to go uh, one at a time, you get a, a space reserved for you, right? Um, and, and that's your seat. And if you, you go into the, you know, the arena to, to watch a hockey match and somebody is in your seat, right? Then that, they're, they're, then you get, you get upset about that. You get, this is my seat, right? This is where I'm supposed to sit. Think about work. You have your own office, right? If you go into your, to your work site, and you take somebody else's office, right? They get upset, right? That's a faux pas. That's that's something that's not, um, you know, accepted. People will reject you for that. So if I'm taking my dad to a jazz society meeting, and I, you know, recognize it starts at 7 p.m., you know, the rituals are we've got to, you know, join the Jazz Society. And we don't have to join it right away, but if we become regular, we'll want to join um, that, you know, people take their seat. There's a business meeting that's carried out that, you know, there might be um, a, uh, you know, a jazz expert who's going to be the main speaker that night at the meeting. Uh, people sit, they order a meal or you know, hors d'oeuvres or something to munch on. Um, those are all rituals. Patterns are where they sit and how they move, right? Now, uh, you know, in church, this is also so predictable. Same thing in community, in your neighborhood, 
you have your yard, right? And, and if you start and go into somebody else's yard to start a bonfire, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to be happy about that. Uh, uh, no matter how neighborly they are, if you're starting to use their space, right? So understanding the importance to be accepted requires that you understand the rules of the game, that what's, what, what is expected to be a member of the Jazz Society? What's expected to be a member of the book club? What's expected uh, to be a member of a community, a neighborhood? Right? What's expected? Cut your grass, you know, make sure you trim, you know, trim your hedges. Those, uh, you know, some places might even have rules like homeowners associations. Uh, homeowners associations actually list the rules. You know, there's a, a commercial where, I don't know what what even what it was for. Where a family moves into a new neighborhood, and the president of the homeowners association, you know, cuts their mailbox off <laughs> because it's too high. The mailbox is too high, right? Now, those kinds of expectations um, become important to know if you want to be accepted, if you want to begin to be absorbed into that community. Now, for those of us in disability support, we're supporting folks who have never been members of these kinds of places and spaces. And, and so they look different. They, they, they stand out, right? Or, or they're easily um, ignored by the other members. That could easily happen. It happens all the time. And if any of you have done you know, community building, you know this, that, that it happens all the time. So understanding the social infrastructure is promoting how can we create a greater possibility for people to be accepted, right? And, and knowing the rules of the game and playing by the rules um, become critical pieces of that challenge, right? So understanding the movements and the motions of that community become important. I, I often tell a story when I'm, when I'm doing training on this um, about my mom. Right? Now, my mom, uh, God rest her soul, she's, uh, she's celebrating in heaven, I think, you know, I hope. But, but uh, mom was kind of hard-nosed, right? And um, when my dad died, um, you know, when my dad got Parkinson's and was, you know, my mom was the primary caretaker for dad. And, and so she dropped out of everything. And one of the things she loved to do, you know, when dad was alive was play bingo. My dad didn't want to do any of that. Uh, but my mom loved playing bingo. And she would go every Wednesday night to church, our church, Mother of Sorrows Church, an Italian uh, parish. Um, would have, you know, their regular bingo, raise money for the church. My mom was regular. She never missed. Um, and if you ever have been to a regular church bingo, you know people have their lucky seats. I bet you you might have your lucky number when you go to the casino and if you're playing roulette, you know, and you bet your lucky number. So, we, you know, humans are like that. We, we're, we're sort of patterned. And, and so my mom you know, when, you know, would go to bingo, she would always have her regular seat. She would play, you know, five cards and, you know, the whole routine. So when dad got sick, mom stopped going and, uh, and, and, you know, basically dropped out of the bingo culture. Right? And, uh, and so dad, you know, after, you know, about seven, eight, pretty, pretty challenging years uh, passed on. And, uh, and so mom, you know, was still grieving, you know, doing the Italian grieving thing. And, uh, and uh, we, you know, so we were concerned, we, we you know, her children and uh, mom, I, you know, I approached her, I said, mom, you got to get you back to bingo. She said, uh, I don't know. I said, come on, you know what, you know, the, why just sit in the house and watch the, let's, let's go back to bingo. So I got mom to go to bingo and I went with her on the, uh, the Wednesday night. And we, we walk into the bingo hall, the social hall at the church. And um, 
you know, there's a there's rituals in bingo. If you've ever, you know, been a regular, you know how that goes. And um, so my mom, you know, went to her lucky chair, her regular seat. Now these are, you know, just long tables. You know how uh, church bingo looks, right? And so mom went to her lucky seat and I said, I'll go get the cards. And so I went up to get cards from my mom and me because I was going to play too. And, and, and I'm walking back to where my mom is sitting and um, there's, I could see a woman hovering near my mom behind her. And, and it was, it was really clear to me and I'm, I'm, you know, fairly astute about, you know, social observation, but it was really, it was very clear to me that my mom was in this woman's seat that since my mom had left bingo, this woman claimed that seat and this was her seat. And she was this woman who was hovering by my mother was really, I could see she was, you know, wrought with what do I do about this? And um, so she, as I'm walking over, she taps my mother on the shoulder and said, excuse me, this, this is my, you know, my lucky seat. And my mom says, go find another seat. This is, you know, this is, <laughs> it was, you know, uh, not a way to win friends and influence people on your return back to a culture. Um, but the notion of patterns become really important. Uh, and, and we want to be sensitive to that. So if we're helping, you know, I mean, give, tell the story of my buddy, David, um, who we helped move out of an institution into the community. David had cerebral palsy. And uh, one of the things David loved when we did a asset inventory was oldies music. He loved oldies music. Right? When he was in this facility, this institution, that's all he listened to. He really wasn't able to do much. He'd, they'd turn the uh, radio on and he'd just kind of sit in his room listening to his, an oldie station. Um, David, very bright guy, very smart guy, astute, um, but physically very challenged, right? He couldn't speak. Um, he couldn't move anything as he was in a, in a chair and needed total support. And um, so when we got David out of uh, this uh, facility, um, we did the asset inventory. You know, Dave, what, what do you like? What do you want to, you know, I'm going to get you involved. David, you know, indicated he wanted oldies. He'd like to, you know, he'd like to listen to oldies. And so do you think there's a community group who gathers to listen to oldies? Do you think there's a culture around oldies? And the answer to that is yes, there is. And uh, I found a bar, a club called The Grove. And it was, um, I found it by calling the oldies radio station that David used to listen to when he was in this institution. And I talked to one of the disc jockeys and he told me about the Grove. He said, you know, they have, you know, they do, we have disc jockeys actually from our radio station who go and play music there. So, so I went and checked the Grove out, right? Remember in community mapping, you want to look physically, is it accessible? Can you get in? Is there parking, the bathrooms, all the stuff that would be necessary for somebody's successful uh, engagement there. So I checked it out. It was, it was good. You know, it was accessible. We could get in. The bathrooms were okay. So um, they, you know, the, the, the rituals of people going every Wednesday to listen to all these is really powerful. I mean, they, what they do, how they behave, you know, trivia things and, you know, people guess songs and the disc jockey plays a little bit of a song. And I mean, all of that stuff was what people part, partook in when they, when they were there. But, but the biggest issue was where are we going to sit when we get in there, right? We didn't want to take somebody else's seat. If we would go in and take, I don't know, John's seat. John's a regular every Wednesday night, listen to all these, gets a bite to eat, has a beer. Um, if we go in and take his seat, that's, that's just like my mom taking the bingo lady's seat, right? It, 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 it creates some tension. It's a hard way to begin to get incorporated, right? So 
understanding is through observation. When I went to the Grove by myself before David and I went, checking it out. Oh, where do, how do people gather, you know, dancing and doing this and singing along and guessing trivia I and mean, all that stuff. Where do they sit? So um, I identified a spot the first two times I went that nobody else was in. And that would be David's spot. So David and I sat there. Now, these are simple things that we oftentimes don't think about when we're community building. Right? We, we, we somehow think, well, we'll just bring David over to the Grove. Everything's going to be fine. That's not how people get embedded, get um, incorporated into a more meaningful situation. Third issue, jargon. What are the words, the technical words that relate to whatever the gathering point is? And every Every group, you know, in church, if you go to your regular going to church, there's words that are specific to scripture and to, and to um, you know, the routine. Um, and, and, and the more you know the words or understand the words, the easier it is to be accepted. Right? And then last uh, in this list of social infrastructure uh, elements, um, is memory. And memory is the history of that community. And every community has a memory. If it's a regular group that gathers on a regular basis, there is some historic trail of how that group was founded, who's played a key role in it. Um, you know, your agency, think about your agency. There's a historic trail there you know, who the previous board members were and the previous executive director. And, you know, they're, 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 there's a celebration of history in every routine organization, right? So understanding a little bit of that history really helps. Families have this with scrapbooks in memory um, where we, you know, we sort of save photos and stories um, that are part of history. Do you remember when we did this? Oh yeah, I remember. You know, that kind of stuff is what the community sort of thrives on, right? History, you know, in, endears uh, people to this community. So these, these things, rituals, which are sort of predictable behaviors and, you know, religious religious behavior is a perfect example. Um, we need to appreciate and understand those with any group that meets on a regular basis. Patterns, where people move, where they sit. You know, the, 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 the TV series, Big Bang series, uh, Theory, um, where, um, where, you know, Sheldon Cooper, Dr. Sheldon Cooper had his spot on the couch. That was his spot. And I bet you, if you think about your own living room, you have your spot and the kids know it. They know your spot. That's mommy's spot. You're in mommy's chair. Oh my God. You know, the kind of reactions that happen related to the patterning of that particular community group. And then jargon are the words, the kinds of things that, that we say um, that are meaningful to that particular culture, right? And then the history, the memory of the group, uh, uh, you know, who came before the gathering of the, of the group. You know, here's a photo, an old, um, you know, second grade, third grade photo um, of, of school. I, I have one just like this. This is not mine, but, but I have one just like that for second grade, third grade, fourth grade. Um, uh, my mom kept them and, you know, uh, so the notion of the past of the group. Now, one of the other things about social infrastructure that's important is neighborliness, right? And neighborliness is uh, really an interesting phenomenon because in any, uh, in any study of social capital, um, neighbors play a really important role, a key role. Um, and, and, and neighbors, you know, have been uh, critical uh, to community success for people. 
even though sometimes you you think about your neighbor, no, I don't like my neighbor, right? But if some if the chips were done and something unfolded and you needed help right away, often that's where we turn. I know in human services, the work that that we do, and we help people get you know apartments or homes in the community. Um, oftentimes, the folks we support don't even know who their neighbors are. Um, I, I, I went and visited a, a program in Kansas City. This was a couple of years ago, and and um, and and the the people who invited me in to do some training for their staff were taking me around to show me some of the programs that they run. And so they took me to, they, we went down this really nice street and um, the person that was my tour guide, um, uh, he said, I bet you, you can't even tell which house is ours on this street. And, and so we drove down and, and, and I said, you know, no, you know, I can't tell. And he said, we really really look to blend in. And we've really coached the people we support to not bother the neighbors as we don't want them to stand out or, to, or, or for the neighbors to not like them. So, you know, we go, when, when, we, when we come in with the van, we go right into the garage, close the garage door. We don't, you know, we don't badger the neighbors. And, and you know, and I, and, and I asked the guy, I said, well, you know, it, badgering what what what's why would that wouldn't wouldn't you want to know your neighbors and and how would we do that intelligently and and in a way that you know that folks can be embraced um as opposed to uh as opposed to hiding or you know keeping you know the you know keeping a kind of a cover over the situation so neighborliness and neighbor phenomena is something I think we need to think about in terms of a community acceptance, right? You don't have to be loved by, you don't have to hang out with your neighbors, but in terms of getting to know people and having people get to know you, and especially when the chips are done, is what, is what neighborliness is all about. Now, obviously some rural areas, this becomes more challenging because there's a dispersal of of, of, of space uh, between perhaps where people live and, and, but where we can do this, we ought to um, awaken to how important it is. Now, investment in social infrastructure is something that really has been studied by sociologists. And there's been, um, uh, there's been, you know, deep thought given to uh, keeping the social infrastructure, especially the technocratic infrastructure, vibrant, right? Uh, because we know that when the social infrastructure is vibrant, is robust, um, you know, people are safer, people feel better about themselves. On the, on the other side of the coin, and this slide captures what research has shown, is when, when the social infrastructure, and again, especially the technocratic infrastructure, degrades, bad things happen. You know, uh, crime goes up, distrust rises, people don't want to participate as much. So investing in uh, the social infrastructure is really something that cities and communities have really attempted to uh, to address. And I'm going to show you just a couple quick examples here. Um, uh, the, 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 this is the high line, this picture. And the high line was an investment, uh, you know, in New York City. This is not far from, by the way, where my son Santino lives. And he lives in New York. And, and, uh, and, and the high line was the uh, elevated subway in New York in this one section near Chelsea in New York City. And it was, you know, they stopped using it because it was really degrading and, and you know, the New York Transit, you know, found alternative ways that they could do things. And so the L, as it's known, just sat there uh, and, and got worse. It, high crime and, you know, drugs and other kinds of bad things uh, started to happen. And, and New York City, you know, really decided to do something about it. Rather than raise it or tear it down, 
they created this park. They call it the High Line. And it's it's beautiful space, you know. And in fact, neighbors actually take care of the flowers and the gardening part of it. And they do it just with pride because it's their neighborhood. And it's a place where people can hang out and be together. Um, they can, you know, have a cup of coffee and sit in the, on the High Line um, up above the traffic and all the, the stuff going on in New York City. And, and so it's been reclaimed as community space for gathering. Right? Um, here's another example. It's called the Beltline. This is in Atlanta. And it was through an area of Atlanta that was blighted, a lot of crime and whatnot. And the community kind of came together and said, boy, you know, let's let's try to use this as, as space that we all can enjoy. Right? Um, here's an example of the Anzac Bridge in Sydney, Australia. And the Anzac Bridge really not just for vehicular traffic, but also created really great opportunities for people to be able from a pedestrian point of view, and people, you know, uh, people were able to utilize um, the bridge um, as, 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 as a place to go for great views um, of the city. Uh, so so the, the, the reclaiming of areas and the use, uh, the, the use of shared physical environment is another infrastructure um, agenda, right? Now, obviously, it's not the key point for us today, but in thinking about infrastructure, we want to make sure that we understand all the elements. So places where people can gather and not be forced out, right? They are perceived as loitering, really present possibilities of building uh, relationships where people can, can spend time together, right? So, so the common space of community, when we think about it, libraries, community centers, rec centers, playgrounds, coffee shops, community gardens. These are all examples of kind of shared space that create uh, opportunity uh, for, for greater uh, engagement among people. Now, in our, in our last session, in the final session that we're going to be doing in our training series, we're going to examine six community ideas that I'm going to you know, lay out there for you to take a look at, think about, that you might want to do in your, own, in your own community, or you might want to consider in your own community, that promotes this idea of shared physical environment. So last session, we talked about community mapping, right, identification of places. The social infrastructure is analyzing and studying if somebody gets involved in any of these things, what are the rituals, patterns, jargon, and memory? What are some of the key things that we can help or you can help coach someone on? So same as what I did with my dad, right, when we found the Pittsburgh Jazz Society, was I went, I wanted to review it, I wanted to learn a little bit about how it manifests so that when we went with dad, he would have a greater, you know, possibility of beginning to, you know, build relationships and become absorbed uh, in that, in that culture, in that community, right? So strategies to soften infrastructure is um, a, a kind of a summary point that I want to, I want to un underscore with you today. How do we, once we find a setting, once we find a target, a community target, how do we soften it? Are there things we could do or are there things we could take advantage of that would make that, um, that resource uh, more pliable for men, women, children we support in our efforts to get them more meaningfully engaged, right? So softening the infrastructure um, first, the first thing that does that is regularity. Just, just the person going again and again and again to the jazz society or to the book club. Um, just that alone begins to soften the other members in terms of what, you know, if they see somebody is committed, 
even if that person looks odd or appears uh, different, the fact that that person's coming again and again and again, you know, really speaks to their sincerity, their, their interest in what that particular group does, right? And, and that alone, I mean, just think in your own, in your own patterning here. Um, if you go regularly somewhere, that signals to the other members of, the, of that group that you, that this is important enough for you to go to, right? That you're, it's important to you to be there and that raises your importance in their, in their eyes, in the other members' eyes, right? So just, you know, Woody Allen famously said, 80% of life success is just showing up, right? And, and, and yet th there's, some, there's some wisdom to that because if you go again and again and again, you're signaling uh, to the other members of that community that I take this serious, this is important to me, right? I wanna be here. I could be somewhere else. I wanna be here, right? Uh, now, with that comes the other element of similarity. When you're there, can you find other ways of, of, of finding common ground with other members? So similarity, you know, in terms of how you dress, similarity in terms of how you carry yourself, similarity in terms of how you behave, respecting um, you know, the expected behaviors of that group, those things also signal that you want to be here and that you're taking this serious and you want to be a member of this group, right? Um, active participation, not just showing up, but signing up to do things, joining committees, um, you know, taking responsibility, some responsibilities, those kinds of things soften the other members in their opinion of you. They say, gee, you know, I always, you know, I went, whenever I joined anything or whenever I join anything, I have, my sense is if, if, I'm, if I'm willing to take time, that is the only thing you can't get back, by the way. You know, your time is precious because once you spend it, it's gone, right? You can't get it back. So if I was going to join something, I always had the attitude, and this was from the time I was a kid, that I'm going to, I'm going to become the president of this group. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my best. I, I remember when when our kids started going to school, and we have three we have three children, and when they were little, and, um, they started going to school, and and so my wife, you know, you know, said to me. I think you should join the PTA, right? And I said, ah, oh, man, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't have time for this. I'm, you know, I'm traveling, I'm doing this, I'm writing. A, and she said, no, I, you know, this is the most serious thing we're doing as, as human beings is raising, um, you know, our kids. And, 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 and she kind of shamed me <laughs> into, into joining, uh, going to the PTA. And so, you know, I thought, you know, if I'm going to go, and she's right, it is the most important thing for me, for my time, is, uh, is, is the, you know, investment in our children. Um, then I said, well, if I'm going to go, then I think I'll, you know, I really want to get invested. So my very first meeting, I signed up for committees and six months into my tenure at the PTA, I ran for president, <laughs> you know, that became the president of the PTA. And, and, you know, and as the president, I said, we're, we're you know, we're really going to, you know, create an inclusionary kind of thing. We're going to get our kids invested in our community. We're going to do some, rather than just raise money for, I don't know, basketball uniforms, we're going to, we're going to invest in our community. And so, you know, uh, we did, we got the kids involved and Saturday morning cleanups in our community and oh, just a whole variety of things trying to establish them as citizens. So actively participating in something is really another way of softening that group. And that group sees that you, you don't only take this serious, but you, 
you actually want to do something for us, you know? Um, respect for the culture, following what the culture demands or recommends. Um, and then alignment with gatekeepers. Now, if any of you guys are familiar with any of the work you, that I do, you've heard the word gatekeepers. You heard me drone on about, about gatekeepers and how important they are in the uh, meaningful engagement process. But this idea of gatekeepers becomes, I think, the most powerful softening process in terms of, 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 of infrastructure. Now, the gatekeeper, as, as you might remember from previous uh, sessions that we've done, the gatekeeper is somebody already a member of the Jazz Society or of the book reading club or of the PTA. They're already a member, whatever that, that group is. And they have some influence with that group, right? They have some impact with that group. And they don't have to be the president or the leader or the head honcho, but they have some impact with the group. They're already a member and they, when they do something, other people um, observe and other people notice, right? And that's called social influence theory. It's a sociological theory about, uh, you know, how opinions get changed or shaped um, is, is through a gatekeeper, right? Um, I mean, the same thing, uh, think about opinions and attitudes that you have right now on, on anything, you know, politics, uh, climate, um, immigration, you know, take any, any of the hot button issues and think about what your position is on that, right? What your, what your attitude is towards that. And then begin to, you know, try to track back and say, how did I come to that opinion? How did I, you know, begin to um, promote this, right? And I guarantee you for on any of that, you're going to be able to track back to a gatekeeper, to somebody that you knew and that you liked, that you really held, you know, held in esteem. And they held that opinion. And maybe you didn't have an opinion at all, or maybe your opinion was opposite. And then you met this person in a group or a club or whatever, and you liked them. And they had a they had a different opinion than you, right? But you really liked them. Start to think, you start to become a little more open saying, well, maybe they're right. Maybe there's some efficacy to their point here. And, and that kind of softening of your opinion, leading you to perhaps another place, that happened through a gatekeeper. And so in community building, this is really true. When, when I got my dad to the... Uh, Pittsburgh Jazz Society. Now, I wasn't a member of the Jazz Society previously. I didn't even know about it. Um, and when I take my dad there for the first time, you know, my, my agenda is, can I find someone here in this group who I could introduce my dad to, who my dad then, he, that person could introduce my dad to the other people. So when when I went for the first time by myself uh, to the Jazz Society to check it out, and uh, um, I met, you know, the, this person that was in charge of membership, and they, they scoped me out because they thought they wanted me to join, you know, and so this person, uh, I started talking to this person, and I said, you know, nah, you know I'm, I'm, I really like jazz too, and I'm going to come with my dad, but I'm, this is really for my dad, I want to get my dad you know, to get involved in some things. He uses a wheelchair and, you know, he, he has Parkinson's, but he loves jazz. And in fact, let me tell you about my dad. And I, I told this membership chairperson about my dad, that he was not just a jazz man in terms of playing upright bass, but he had written for Don, you know, Don Beat Magazine. He interviewed Duke Ellington 
and Ella Fitzgerald and Stanley Tarantine and these jazz greats. My dad actually sat with them and did interviews and wrote articles about their performances in Pittsburgh. And this membership chairman, when I was telling her about this, her eyes, she said, your dad met Duke Ellington. <laughs> I said, I said, yeah. She said, oh man. So when, when we came with dad, the membership chairperson, she had already told all these other people of my dad's history as a jazz man, right? And, and, and so we walked in and it was almost like my, like these folks, could, they, they could care less about the wheelchair or the tremoring. They, they wanted to know about Duke, you know, and, uh, what, and they wanted to know about Ella. And I mean, those kinds of things are really, really powerful. This woman was sort of like the gatekeeper. She sort of paved the way. She began to introduce my dad to other people. And, and, but my dad's, my dad's profile also paved the way. Now, that may or may not be an issue that we're looking at when we're community building. Um, but, you know, recognizing what causes people uh, to, in, you know, to, to open up, to soften up. So when we think about identifying gatekeepers, there are some variables, observable variables that, um, that people show that might suggest that they would be a suitable gatekeeper for you to introduce the person you're uh, bringing or supporting uh, to this community resource, right? Here are some things that we know um, about people willing to take social risk, people willing to uh, open the gates to communities that they're members of, people who are talkative, uh, outgoing, uh, expressive, sort of entertaining, sociable, uh, people who mix well, people who have some charm about them. There's something about them that's really charming you know, to, to you, you observe that. Um, these kinds of variables are ones that can identify who that gatekeeper might be, that you might then introduce the person you're supporting to them. So through their introduction of the person you're supporting to the rest of that community softens that community. Now, remember those other things are equally important, regularity, committing, um, you know, being act, finding other similarities, being actively engaged, all of that are, all of those behaviors are, are, are things that soften as well. And so enlisting a gatekeeper is really as simple as just asking, right? Um, uh, you know, I, I know when, when I was talking to this membership chair uh, um, at, at, at the Pittsburgh Jazz Society, you know, I just said, what well, if I brought my dad over, would, would you introduce him around? You know, you know everybody here. And she said, Abs, of course I will. Yeah, I'll be happy to. Just asked her to do it. Because I couldn't. I couldn't introduce my dad to, to that audience because um, I didn't know them, right? I was there to support my dad, you know, make sure that he was comfortable. Um, but, but I, you know, I, it wasn't my job to you know, begin to get him known there, right? So this, this notion with the gatekeeper, the, 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 the theory behind this, and this is, a, this is a big word, you can see it here, value juxtaposition. It sounds like a big word. It, it's a simple concept though. Value juxtaposition is simply when people are juxtaposed or connected. If somebody is valued, and they're juxtaposed to my dad, my dad's value starts to rise, right? So if the membership chairperson is liked, everybody likes her, and she's with my dad introducing him around, other people notice that and say, gee, he looks strange, he's in that chair and he's shaking, but he's with Mimi and we like Mimi, right? So, so the, the notion of identifying the gatekeeper becomes I think the key infrastructure element in, in our work. So 
you know, every accomplishment starts with the, you know, the decision to, you know, to give it a try, right? Um, and where you are shapes who you will be. I mean, this is really a powerful quote. Stop and think about this quote for a minute. It's by Eric uh, Kleinenberg, who wrote a wonderful book, by the way. In fact, it's, I think, the definitive book on social infrastructure. It's called Palaces for the People. Palaces for the People. And, and, and you know, Kleinenberg, you know, great examples of, 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 of social infrastructure ideas. But Look at this quote, where you are shapes who you will be, right? So the notion of people being a part of something beyond who they are right now positions them to a better place, okay? So let me just finish with this, this quote from a, another, you know, wonderful um, purveyor of community. His name is Peter Block. Here, here's his book. This book is wonderful. It's called um, The Structure of Belonging. The Structure of Belonging, right? How do you belong to community? It's by Peter Block. And Block is, you know, out of Cincinnati. He's really one of the, the you know, most forward-thinking proponents of community. And he says here, the need uh, to create structure of belonging grows out of the isolated nature of our lives and institutions and our communities. The absence of belonging is so widespread um, that the way we live are living in an age of isolation, right? Ironically, we talk today about how small our world has become. The cost of our detachment and disconnection is not only our isolation, our loneliness, that there may that there are too many people in our communities whose gifts remain on the margin. This is so true in our work. You know, the, the men and women that, that many of us who are involved with agencies like Community Living Algoma know, their gifts just remain hidden, right? Um, the need for belonging is not just a personal struggle for connection but also a community struggle. Community offers the promise of belonging and calls for us to acknowledge our interdependence. To belong is to act as an investor and owner and creator of this place. To, to be welcome, even strangers, as if we came to the right place and are affirmed for that choice. Right? I, I love, uh, you know, just a simple kind of reflection on the structure of belonging, um, I think is awakening for us. And so let me, let me just uh, finish up with uh, some contact information. I try to do this at the end of every one of our sessions by welcoming you um, to think about this, pose uh, some questions or thoughts that you might have that we can do. And as Tanya said in the beginning of the, of the presentation, that uh, if you have any questions, you get them into the chat box or into the Q&A, um, uh, we'll have a chance to review them But if, if, if right now. But if, if you didn't get a chance or if you don't have you know, an opportunity to get a question or if we don't get to your question, please know that you can pose it to me. Here's my, my email address. I'm happy to react or respond um, uh, to, to you know, the thoughts that you might have uh, about this. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to I'm going to flip over to the Brady Bunch, you know, pictures <laughs> that, are, that are on our our Zoom uh, our Zoom thing, and. Um, uh, I'm going to open it up. We we it's now about 25 after 11. We go till uh, till noon, so we have a half an hour uh, to engage or to respond to questions or thoughts you have. And I I know that we went through a lot of stuff and and a talking head, you know, just sitting there passively listening to some talking head is not 
um, is not uh, all that exciting. But this is an opportunity now for you to raise a question if you haven't already um, in the chat room. Uh, and we can also do questions live as well. Um, if, if you have, if, 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 if you, if something that I said um, spurs uh, either a reflection, it doesn't have to even be questioned, just a, a reflection on this or a, a, you know, a acknowledgement of an experience perhaps that you had where some of these component parts maybe played a role. Right? So let me, let me just uh, ask Corey if there's anything that she can uh, summarize. I see there's maybe four things in the chat room right now. Um, so Corey, do we have something you can summarize? Uh, it doesn't have to be a question. It could just be a comment or a reflection. Well, there is a question. Um, the question is what if the gatekeeper is not so welcoming? Mm. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And it really, you know, when I started to write about the gatekeeper and I, um, I, I, I started to actually write about this in uh, 2002, right? So that's a good, almost a good 19 years ago when I first wrote about it in a book uh, called, the book was called Cultural Shifting. And I, I, you know, I, 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 I introduced the idea of the gatekeeper, but in that, in that book and subsequently in writings that I've done since then, and in chances to, to talk about this, I acknowledge that there are three types of potential gatekeepers, right? There are positive gatekeepers, and they're the kind of people that showed that list. Remember I had that list, talkative, inquisitive, spontaneous, charming, Though, those kinds of variables are often associated with positive gatekeepers who see opportunity. Because there's also another type of gatekeeper, a negative gatekeeper, and a, a person who doesn't want to open the gates. They want to keep them closed and they want to keep people out. And not in my backyard or not my neighborhood do we do this or have this. Uh, this idea of building walls between people, which we we see happening even in governments. Look at look at the United States, uh, um, you know, with the Trump administration and the you know the banning of people and the building of walls and you know. So the notion of uh, of a positive gatekeeper is the kind of person who builds bridges. A negative gatekeeper actually keeps people out. So to the question. What I would say is you don't want to enlist a negative gatekeeper. Uh, you don't want to enlist somebody who is, who is uh, um, you know, who, who <clears throat> for whatever reason is not liked themselves, right? Um, what you want to do is you want to find somebody who other people um, like and look up to. I mean, you can see this, uh, think, just think about, you know, uh, parties that you've been to or gatherings that you've been to. And, you know, there are, you can see the positive gatekeepers just through observation, you know, um, just almost through an aura that they show where they, you know, I'll, I'll go uh, to, a, to a gathering and I'll walk in, I'll be by myself, and maybe not know that many people. And I'll just observe, and I could see people that that I think, wow, that would be somebody I would really, I really would like to know. That's someone that I, I you know, that real that person really seems to be um, attractive. And when I say attractive, I mean sociologically that they they seem to be a person who's connected. So my my recommendation would be that if the person is not liked or if the person is negative or uh, like bummed out, that, uh, that, that, that you, don't, you don't wanna choose that person as a gatekeeper, right? You would just let that person be and you wanna try to find somebody who seems to be more robust. Let, let me give just one last example on this. This is a, a great question. Um, think about your own agency or your own place of work, wherever you happen to be. And think about who you would want to orient a new employee, who you would want 
to take them around and show them the ropes at your agency, their first day on the job. Um, you wouldn't want them to be with somebody who's who's your like bad or worst employee, right? You wouldn't want a newcomer to be oriented by somebody who's bummed out by the agency, doesn't like, is not liked, doesn't like people, you know, is always whining and moaning. That's not a person you would choose to orient. You would choose somebody who's upbeat and who people like, because when that new employee is walking around the agency with this uh, staff member that you've chosen to orient them, you want their value to go up. You want that new employee's value. And also you want the new employee to be energized by someone positive rather than to have that. I mean, just think, take, take somebody on your staff who whines and moans all the time, never sees the good in anything. Right? And I know you know some people like that right, on your staff. Think about them taking a new employee around your agency and, you know, whining and moaning. Oh, man, we don't make much money here. And, uh, you know, John's a, is a drag. He, you know, he's never around. And, uh, you know, Tanya, you know, she always is uh, whining, moaning. I mean, that kind of person just extinguishes energy. Right. We want to try to find people who promote, who are, en who are energized themselves. And the same thing is true with the gatekeeper. If you're, you know, if I'm looking around the members of the Pittsburgh Jazz Society, you know, I, 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 this, this, this woman maybe was the membership chair, right? And everybody knew her and everybody liked her and she was invested. So it was a perfect, you know, person to ask to introduce my dad around, right? Um, so that's the kind of person you want to look for. You don't want to we don't want to make this harder. I mean, holy moly, it's hard enough to begin with because we're representing folks whose situations are pretty challenging and who've never really been in things like this or might intellectually really not be able to, you know, align a whole lot. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't have something to share and, 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 and to bring to that table, right? So, um, finding the gatekeeper becomes really, really an important social infrastructure intervention. Great question. Corey, what else? Okay, so next uh, comment question um, comes from John. So hi, Al, you delivered a powerful presentation today that helps us understand the macro work we need to do. I reflect on your presentation and this work sounds so simple. What is it that creates the barriers to achieving greater acceptance and belonging? For example, getting to know your neighbors is such an easy task, yet many opinions and attitudes get in the way. Have we forgotten the value of social capital and a strong social infrastructure? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, thanks, John. Uh, you know, and, and that's really more of a statement than it is a question um, that, that there's no, you know, there's, there's no question that um, the points you made are, are really um, uh, poignant and important. Um, the idea of neighborliness um, is something, when you stop and think about your own behavior in your own community, you know, let's, let's, let's take the people we serve off the, uh, uh, out of the equation just for now, and think about your own neighborliness. Uh, and, and if you live in a, you know, in, in a physical uh, situation where, you know, you do have neighbors and you see uh, people on a regular basis, uh, just think about how you uh, behave and how you would like other people to behave toward you, right? And how you learned how to behave that way, right? We don't, it's like, we're not taught how to be good neighbors, like uh, in, in some kind of a formal pedagogical way where, you know, somebody sits with us and says, here's what good neighbors, you know, this is how people are good neighbors. Um, we learn to be good neighbors through observation and often through observation of our moms and dads, uh, observation uh, of other people that, um, that we're we're uh, impressed by or that we are enamored uh, by. 
and and so when when we think about the folks we serve um being good neighbors um it is really no different uh, this is kind of coaching and observation and recommendation that we make in terms of neighborliness um you we we sort of know like where's the line of when you become a pain in the butt neighbor as opposed to being a good neighbor right uh, the neighbor that's always i don't know taking or always um you know uh, always that you almost want to avoid uh because of the way they behave and and really kind of just thinking about that in a way that we can coach uh some of this and and we can we can um we can um mimic it because social observation is really a powerful way of learning things that's where we've learned um how to engage how to um, carry ourselves in a social situation. We've learned that through observation. Um, we haven't taken courses on it. And so part of our responsibility, I believe, with the folks that we are supporting, and you know, if you're a DSP and you're kind of on the front line and you're supporting um, you know, folks, how you carry yourself and behave really speaks volumes to you know, what folks then begin to do themselves, right? So your modeling and your coaching and your recommendation, when somebody just becomes too friendly too quickly, you know, that, 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 that there, there's all these sort of pieces of that puzzle. Um, but I think neighborliness is really, really an area that we've kind of forgotten that we haven't really looked at. Social capital theory talks a lot about neighborly neighborliness. Um, Putnam, in fact, John, you remember that when you know a number of years ago when 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 I came up a couple times to uh, Algoma uh, to Sault Ste. Marie, and and we had conversations with with our staff about this. Uh, we did the social capital benchmarking survey. And that benchmarking survey actually asks questions. Do you know your neighbor's names? Um, have you ever been in your neighbor's home? Have your neighbors ever been in your home? Right? Those kinds of things sociologists really feel are important for the fabric of community. And we've gotten away from a lot of this, obviously. I mean, a lot of people don't even know their neighbors, don't want to know their neighbors, right? Uh, they say that out loud. And, um, and, 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 and so I think there's, a, there's so much to this over and above the strategies that we're talking about in building community for folks who have been left behind. Um, and, and I think it's really pause for all of us to reflect and to think about our own behavior, because in the end, that's that's the thing that we really that's the only thing we can control um we can't control other people and we can't force other the only thing we can really control is how we choose to behave and um and so i think the reflection on social infrastructure and these ingredients that that make up social infrastructure uh, are really important uh for for reflection Corey, what else? Okay, still quite a few more, Al. So the next one is in smaller communities, how do we balance the desire for people to participate without overwhelming the activity with our own unique culture? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, 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 a fantastic question because we've been guilty, those of us in human services who, have work, uh, who work with agencies that support folks, we've been guilty of... Um, not, not, um, of, 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 what's the word I'm searching for here, of, of not doing uh, the right thing there, of taking groups of people places, and as opposed to the individual kind of thing that, that I think is required here. Um, and, and so in this community building agenda and initiative, one of the things that we 
or want to do in our project, in the project I mentioned when we started, um, is really identify a group of people we're serving right now. And with, we're looking at 10 people, actually, we're going to try to do this in a, in a thoughtful, um, almost research oriented way. And with these 10 people, we want to provide wraparound services so we can in individualize this as much as possible. And rather than bring groups of people places, we want to go one at a time because we don't want to overdose or um, over influence, a, you know, a, a resource with five, six, seven people with disabilities from, you know, community living Algoma who, who, you know, are now going to this, um, you know, camera club or, you know, whatever, whatever the resource is. Um, so we, we want to really try to individualize as much as we can uh, so that when, when the person we're supporting penetrates into the new, new resource, um, the other members of the community don't see them as, well, that's a community living Algoma person. Uh, those are CLA people, you know, and, which is what we've heard, by the way, um, from, you know, community citizens was that somehow, some way, um, men and women with disabilities have gotten, you know, typecast as clients of community living Algoma. Um, so we want to, we want to really be thoughtful and intentional here and individualized as best as we can, um, on the other side of the coin, we know by doing that, because we have ratios of staff support, um, there are other people who might not get to go or go as, as often to some place that they're currently going to. And, and so I think, you know, in some ways there's trade-offs here. Uh, there, there can be, with any treatment, let me let me just let me summarize the this question this way. There's a there there's a term used in medicine called iatrogenesis. Iatrogenesis. It it means physician caused harm. It's a Greek word that means when the physician or the 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 the, the, the intervener uh, does harm, right? And the theory of iatrogenesis. Is, is that anytime you do something, anytime there's an intervention, whether it's in medicine or whether it's social intervention, like we're talking about here, this is social intervention. Anytime you do an intervention, there's good things that can happen and there's potentially bad things that can happen, right? In any treatment, when a doctor gives you a medicine, you know, uh, when you see a commercial for medicine, you see, they give you the whole laundry list. So you could die from this product. You can have a stroke. You can, you know, but it's going to help, you know, manage your blood pressure or whatever, you know, the intentionality of the, of the medicine is. That's iatrogenesis. Iatrogenesis is the good things and the bad things. And physicians take an oath to do as little harm as they possibly can with an intervention, right? They know there's still going to be some harm, even with an aspirin you're going to get some harm to your belly, right? Um, but the good of getting rid of the pain supersedes the bellyache that the aspirin is going to bring, right? So, so anytime your doctor uh, makes a recommendation of intervention for you for some medical reason, there's good things and bad things to chemotherapy. There's good things and bad things to, you know, to anything, that you um, that you're being recommended, and the doc's job is to minimize the bad and maximize the good, right? So from social intervention, it's the very same thing. We know that there's good things and bad things about um, what we've been talking about. Um, we want to maximize the good and minimize the bad, and uh, there is going to be some, you know, I mean, even in community, there's risk, and we've talked about this before that if somebody gets involved in the you know in a in, in a community group uh individually and we have some staff supporting them and we get the staff to begin to fade 
you know, that person, even with the staff member there, that person's at risk of maybe something bad happening or somebody taking advantage of them or making fun of them or calling them a name. I mean, there's those, those risks are there. So we want to maximize the good, minimize the bad as best as we can. Great question. Corey. Thanks, Al. So next question. How do we connect people we support to infrastructures that have perceived stigma and shame attached to them? These mm -hmm. infrastructures often run underground and have organic starts and aren't easy to connect to. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's really a complex um, that's a complex question. And um, I don't know if I could, you know, give a, a quick uh, reaction to that. Um, you know, stigma is, is a real thing and it, and it's there and stigma plays both internally and externally, right? There's ex external ripples of stigma and there's internal feelings of stigma that, um, are associated certainly with disability and, um, and, and I don't, you know, I, I guess my, my only reaction to that is that there's still going to be stigma that some people are going to carry about something they believe or, or feel or some experience they had. Um, and you're never going to get rid of that with, you know, with some persons. But I think you can lessen um, the effects of stigma through these things that we've talked about, regularity, similarity, um, engaging more, becoming actively participating, um, and finding the gatekeeper, having the gatekeeper do some introductions. All of those things, I think, can lessen uh, stigma, um, but I don't think we ever eradicate it. I, I think that there's always going to be some <sighs> elements uh, of stigma, some alternative reality that somebody has about, about something that that's unfolding. Um, and, 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 you know, the best we can do is just try to lessen it. I think that's, that's, a, that's, I mean, it's really a complex question. I'd love to be sitting over a beer or, um, you know, a cup of coffee with the person who raised that question. Uh, to, to engage more about it. It's, it, it's really thoughtful, very deep. Other questions, Corey, as we round the corner, we got about 10 minutes. Yeah, there's still uh, a couple. I don't want to be a clock, wa a clock watcher, but I, but I want to be sensitive and respectful of your time and energy. This was a, you know, two hour, um, two hour deal. We want to make sure we stay on time. Right, so still a couple, still a couple more, uh, Al. So the next comment is, uh, I love the word neighborly list, late neighborliness, yeah. and the comment about neighbors playing a key piece to community success for people. COVID has confirmed how lonely people are and how important it is to be connected to unpaid supports. We have a lot of work to do, but I'm excited. Our focus is on connecting people to getting to know their neighbors. Tanya. Great, that was a comment, and and it's a really good a good one. Um, that that there's there's no question of our all of our faces have been rubbed in the the elements of isolation and loneliness. I mean, this pandemic, if it you know it's affected all of us more ways than we really know, and uh, I think there's going to be ripples, and you know things are going to be different going forward. Um, but I think the, the, what we learn, what we've learned, uh, from this pandemic is, is also, um, an awakening, an awakening for all of us about how important we are to each other, right? And some people that we serve have lived with social isolation their whole life. They've lived with quarantines their whole life. They've, they don't know another reality. And, and, and so I think the awakening to us is, man, this is what it feels like. And, and, um, and even if somebody seems to be okay with it, um, it's not okay. Right? And, 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 and 
so maybe maybe renewing our passion for each other and for how important we are to each other um, is the lesson we can take from from this experience with COVID, and 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 to you know to do our best that we can not just as staff members but as community members and neighbors and and family members and friends with other kinds of uh, people um, uh, in our networks and 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 just be just be a better friend just be a better a better human being great great point Corey, what else we have? Last comment. So it's also very important that once the groundwork has been laid with the neighbors, that it's important to continue fostering that relationship. I'm involved in a local community gardening group and we have learned the hard way how we can inadvertently offend our neighbors by not maintaining and fostering the existing relationships. And we had to work really hard to repair and renew those relationships. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, another, another great comment. Um, it, you know, it's really interesting that with that gardening uh, experience that the, the person who raised the question brought, um, I was just on a webinar um, uh, last week, at the very end of last week, and um, it, we, were, we were talking about this very, this very phenomenon, uh, social infrastructure, and one of, the, one of the persons who was on the call um, raised the question and said, that their wife, and this guy works for a human service agency like Community Living Algoma, right? And, uh, and his wife uh, volunteers with a garden, with a gardening uh, group. And uh, she, last summer, she, because of him, because of her, you know, her relationship with him, sensitive to disability. So she raised the issue that let's, Let's create some raised uh, planters um, in, for our gardening project, um, and you know maybe there's um, maybe you know that we, we can have some other members join into our club who happen to use wheelchairs, and and a couple of the other members of the club really reacted negatively to that and said, well, it's costly to do that, and it's going to take more space, you know, if we have to you know, prop things up. And I mean, they, they had these excuses to uh, not be as accessible uh, in their infrastructure as, as they could be. Um, and it was, you know, she was really taken aback by, by the negative reaction that people that she had been gardening with in this club, well, they were nice people and she liked them and they weren't mean, um, it, 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 but they were resistant, you know, to this idea. And of course, they used economy as a rationale for not being accessible. Um, we've seen that in the United States with the passage of the ADA, where businesses have chosen not to uh, put in ramps or other kinds of uh, accessibility um, uh, aspects. Uh, by and and their excuse is well we don't get any customers with who use wheelchairs so why would we have to make all this expenditure to create a you know a, a ramp when we don't have I mean if we had some customers who had wheelchair I could see doing that but we don't have any customers so this mentality of well they're not here so they really don't have this need or they really don't want this. Um, that's part of the that's part of the problem you know that that kind of so so you don't you you create gardening opportunities that are that are raised now two things happen possibly somebody who uses a wheelchair could actually now garden with us and i don't have to stoop over those darn darn plants myself right i save my back and we also make this uh, relevant. So I think, you know, thinking about the advantages of a diverse group of people joining into the infrastructure is another, you know, another card. Not that we play it from a sense of, you know, appealing to that, that 
community group. Um, if you get more people with disabilities, it's going to be better for you. Um, but I think somehow, some way, planting that seed that when I get to meet somebody who's different from it, it just it's better for me. It makes me a better person. It broadens my own perspective, and um, and and get more thinking that way. Uh, it's it's really it's really interesting the resistances that can happen in community. Um, not just to people with disabilities, but to any difference that they haven't experienced. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think the other, the other piece to this is um, disability advocates. I'm, you know, I, 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 was, I think I was mentioning to our leadership team in our project that I, I found an article about, a, about a, um, an initiative that was happening in Houston done by uh, folks in the intellectual disability community to create a uh, bar, a club, a, a social, like a disco um, for people with intellectual disabilities where they can be safe, uh, they can come, they can have these uh, mock drinks and listen to music and dance and, and not, you know, not feel threatened. And families really, really saw this as like a wonderful idea. And they were really encouraging the agency. This was an agency that served people with intellectual disabilities. They were encouraging them to do it uh, because they really felt that their sons and daughters just weren't going to be successful um, in, a, in a regular disco or bar. And that kind of backlash is out there. And that kind of thinking, well, let's find a place for them. This is a place for your kind. And this is a place for that kind of people. And, and this compartmentalization of, of human beings, I think, is happening. It's, it's insidiously uh, influencing um, our communities. And, 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 you know, I think we have to, we have to really reckon with that. Um, is that good for our community uh, to have a little disco for people with intellectual disabilities? Is that, I mean, is that, you know, or is it better to sensitize and create the infrastructure in our existing discos so that people with intellectual disabilities can participate and have fun and be safe? You know, um, it, 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 it's a challenging, challenging question. I, and we're not, you know, we, we're not going to answer it with our, our session today. I think it's something we have to continue to reflect on. But I think we've gotten the majority of questions, Corey. And uh, if there's anything else that anybody has on the call, does, you know, doesn't really matter where you're from or, or what the question is, please feel free to uh, drop, drop a note to me. Um, uh, I'd be happy to engage with you about that. Um, also know that we have one more session coming up. Um, it's going to be our last session where we're going to look at six ideas about community building, little projects that we can do in our own communities uh, or consider in our own communities um, uh, that we, we, might, we, you know, we, we might reflect on. I'm going to lay out these six ideas, and then we'll have a chance to uh, talk about, um, about them and maybe others that you might have, other ideas that you might have uh, as well. Um, in the, you know, as I close, and I'll, I'll toss it over to Tanya to, 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 to do a final conclusion, but let me thank you uh, for taking time um, uh, this morning to reflect on, on these things. Um, I don't know if we've answered all the questions or if we've come up with, with um, you know, fully satisfying responses to, uh, to, to, to your inquiry, but I think we're on the track, right? And these ideas uh, really cause us to reflect a bit on our own behavior and think about interventions that really can be um, uh, more, more positive and more powerful for the men and women we serve. So I'm gonna thank you for being here. I wanna thank Tanya and, and, and John, Community Living Algoma for sponsoring this. And we'll look forward to, I don't have the date, Tanya can give you the date on our final. Um, yeah. Just thanks a lot.
Well, thank you. So this session, like we were saying, is going to be recorded. And once we convert from Zoom to YouTube, we'll make sure you have the link for today or anyone who wanted it, who can't or couldn't attend today, we'll make sure they have a copy of it. And um, session five, macro change, the key ingredient for community success is on March 9th from 10 to 12 Eastern Standard Time. So thank you, everyone. And have a great day. Thank have you. Have a great day and a good week. Thank uh, you so much.